Thank you very much. The piece I just played for you is a little excerpt from a larger piece of music entitled Call. It was composed by James Stephenson, a living, breathing, professional composer of music. I'm not here to promote his music or anyone else's specifically, and it's very important to me that you understand that I'm not here to prioritize the quality or meaning of any one style of music over another. My motivation for playing that little excerpt for you is simply to demonstrate that I've taken music seriously in my life. I've had a wonderful career so far in music. It's meant a lot and done a lot for me. And through my career of teaching, writing, and playing music, I've listened to a lot of music. And over the past few years, I've become concerned about how our relationship to music is changing. I believe that our fundamental relationship to music is changing in ways that we should all be concerned about whether or not you're a music lover like me or not. I hope that you're able to listen and not just hear what I played for you. Listening to music is an active and integrative experience. It's an act of being present in mind, body, and spirit in purposeful and intentional kinds of ways which engage the audience and the performers alike. Hearing music is much more passive. We go to concerts to listen to music and you hear music in elevators and shopping malls and in department stores. People like me often refer to the latter as Muzak. So music and Muzak are at the ends of kind of an exper experiential spectrum in which we're either engaged or unengaged or partially engaged with music. And you might think that music affects us because we're paying attention to it, and Muzak does not, but I can assure you that that's not the case. Music in all of its forms affect us all deeply. I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of music in very, very broad and general terms. Now, it's very common knowledge that virtually all traditional cultures worldwide have had music deeply embedded within them, and that music was in these cultures, and, and still is in certain parts of the world, central to many cultural traditions and social traditions. Music in these settings was designed to do something very important to and for people. The late professor of mythology, Joseph Campbell, talked at length about how traditional cultures worldwide had ceremonies for going to war, for peace, for birth, for death, for when boys were to become men, when girls were to become women, and many other uh, important rites of passage. Campbell talked about how it was the artist or the shaman in these settings who usually played the central role in propagating these cultural rites of human passage forward. And again, music was central to these activities. Daniel Levitin, a uh, neuroscientist and uh, psychologist, cites in his Library of Congress speech that music likely preceded spoken language in human evolution, and that music still tends to light up many parts of our human brain at once, including the primordial part of the brain, our lizard brain back here, that we share with all mammalian species. Music seems to be an integral part of our collective heritage. It's helped us survive and evolve as a species. We've been in the company of music for a very, very long time. Now, the jury is still out in the scientific community whether or not human beings alone own music. And what I mean by that is some scientists think that animals who are not human can also do music. Either way, to me, all you need to do is look at young children responding innocently to music to understand that humans, for certain, are, in a sense, hardwired to engage with music in deep and meaningful ways. So if music has been with us for so long, and if it's been so important to us as a species, why have we become so cavalier with respect to what we listen to? There's a beautiful documentary on the web that I'd highly encourage you all to check out. It's entitled The Cave of Forgotten Dreams. And it sheds light on the Chauvet Caves of France, these caves contain largely undisturbed cave paintings like this one. This is an actual painting uh, in the cave that dates back tens of thousands of years. In a nearby cave, they discovered a flute seen at the top of this slide, and scientists believe that this flute is between 35,000 and 40,000 years old. When an exact replica of that flute was uh, recreated and played, it created the major pentatonic scale. And I'll go into a little bit more detail of what that is. But for now, that flute discovery left a profound impact on people like me and many other musicians that I know. If indeed music and art preceded language in our evolution, 
What would that world have looked like and sounded like? Imagine a world potentially without words as we know it, but with music, with art, I'd like to believe with dance too. This 40,000 year old major pentatonic scale is still in use today. And there it is, it's the black notes on the piano. If you're not a musician and you can get access to a piano sometime, try raking your hands over just the black notes, starting on the bottom black note of the group of three and going up the piano. When you do this, you are playing that same 40,000 year old plus scale. When you do that, take your time. Let that experience kind of sit in with you and sit inside you. It's important that you realize that the person who manufactured that ancient flute from a hollow bird bone from which it was created, they drilled holes in that flute in very specific spots to create that very specific scale sound. When I play music using that same scale, I sometimes have an experience that somehow links me to those ancient beings in ways that it's impossible to put into words, all through that little five note scale. Let me play the scale for you. Now let me play you the beginning of a little song and this is one of almost an infinite number of songs that can be generated using just that little five note scale. If we accept that we're in some ways hardwired to experience music in a way in which is informed by thousands of years of communal listening, communal mu music making, a question arises for me that I'd like you to consider. How is our relationship to music changing? How is our relationship to each other changing as we move away from experiencing music live and in groups to an environment in which we are more and more listening to recordings of music, reproductions of music, more often than not, when we're alone. How is our relationship changing when we're just hearing music as opposed to listening to it? To explore this question, I'd like to approach it from kind of a strange angle and talk to you about a concept entitled confirmation bias. So confirmation bias is the tendency to favor information that reinforces our pre-existing beliefs, our biases. We've seen a sharp rise in confirmation bias in the news media, for example, where people now select the news media outlet from the variety of options out there that best fit their idea of how the world works or how they think the world ought to work. When people purchase books online, the retailer suggests similar books. When people watch streamed movies, at the end of the movie it says, here's another movie that's 98% matched to what you just watched. We're being encouraged to read the same books and watch the same bloody movies over and over again. <laughs> and people are loving it. We've seen a sharp rise in musical confirmation bias through an ever-growing sense of musical homogeneity reinforced by logarithms on the internet. This leads to people knowing what they like because they like what they know. It's comfortable. Confirmation bias limits us from experiencing the world in new or even just in alternative ways. And technology is discouraging us from experiencing music and the world in old and more traditional ways. So again, how is this affecting us? If music has been with us as a species for at least 40,000 years, again, perhaps before we had spoken language, if it's a strong and powerful social bonding tool that can be used to help regulate our lives individually and collectively, as in groups, if it can be used to inspire and express the very best of our humanity, including the sensual that cannot be expressed in any other way, then we must accept that music not the lack of music, but music itself also has the capacity to diminish our community, to dull our humanity, to unenlighten us, to unregulate us. And in general, it has the power to influence, uh, influence us into behaving in the most inhumane of ways. Music affects us all that deeply throughout that whole spectrum.
So here's a thought experiment for you if this is all true. If consuming music by analogy is like eating food for our mind and body, here's an idea I'd like you to consider. It's called a musical grocery store of sorts. And in this musical grocery store, should we be encouraging musical gluttony? It's free, it's easy to access, access music. Go ahead and stick whatever you want in your ears as much as you want, all while not being particularly careful about what you're consuming. In this musical grocery store, everything is free. And that might seem like a good thing. Anyone can take anything they want off the shelf. However, keep in mind that anyone from anywhere can put anything they want on the shelf. There are no restrictions. The packaging of this music need not be remotely accurate. The music need not do what it's designed to do or advertised to do, pardon me. In this store, music is the sweetener that can be added to any message. Music makes any message easier to swallow. In the book Salt, Sugar, Fat, the author Michael Pollan states that we are living in a world where people are now experiencing obesity and malnutrition at the same time. And when I heard this, I immediately thought of this, this music analogy to food. Again, by way of analogy, can we infer that something is happening to us collectively and individually in this ubiquitous world of musical consumption? I said this was a thought experiment, it's not. We're already living in this world and we have been for some time. So as we move through the 21st century, I wonder who is going to speak to issues stemming from our arbitrary, perhaps even reckless musical co consumption habits? Who's even responsible for asking these questions and to whom should they be asked? If you agree that we might need to be more thoughtful about our musical choices, here's again a little musical grocery list that I'd like you to consider. Support local music in all of its forms in your community. If you have children, especially young children, play music in the home that is good for the children, not simply familiar favorites for the adults. And adults and kids alike should think about considering, about participating in music where they're listening to quality music out loud and in groups together. Learn a little bit about the musicians and the composers who are writing the music that you're listening to. Try to figure out their message. And I'd consider you let yourself listen to a piece of music multiple times before drawing quick conclusions about it. In this regard, I'm asking you to consider working a little bit to try to understand music that doesn't quite sit well with you. Maybe it's not familiar to you. It might be a little quirky. Give it a chance. In terms of reeling against confirmation bias, I'd like to invite someone out there to develop a logarithm for the internet that, that encourages diversified listening behaviors in people, rather than the current system, which is encouraging ever more tightened confirmation biases. It's limiting the music that we listen to. I'm not suggesting that in any way we develop governmental controls with respect to what we're allowed to listen to. Suggesting anything like this would be absurd and useless. However, I am saying, that should you abdicate your right to choose what to listen to, rest assured that others in our community and abroad will do their utmost to influence how you think and feel through music because they understand how impactful and influential music is. I began this talk saying that I hope you were able to listen and not just hear that little piece of music I played for you. If you thought I was asking you to listen like a trained professional musician, then you're mistaken. I was asking you to take music and music's effect on us seriously, to listen to music with the same intent that I believe our ancestors did 40,000 years ago. Doing so, I believe it will lead to a world with less extreme politics, a world in which people are more compassionate and tolerant of each other's differences a world in which we are more sensitive to the array of issues that confront us all every day, and we have big issues to deal with. This can all be achieved through engagement with one another through music. So thank you, and please listen carefully.